It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And of course, our um, thoughts and prayers support with the uh, families and colleagues of the um, tragically uh, deceased uh, pilots and uh, paramedics um, here in the province of Ontario. Appreciate the moment of silence from the Minister of Health. Uh, my question, uh, Speaker, is Minister of Finance uh, today. Minister, do you have a plan to bring in a significant increase in user fees to help pay for your runaway spending? I bet you do. Mm. Mr. Speaker, uh, what we have as a plan is to reduce the deficit, is to continue on our, our track to continue investing in our. If we're uh, going to start, I'll start right away. Right away, all members. <laughs> Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, we have a plan to continue to invest in our youth, to continue investing in infrastructure, and uh, continuing to ensure that we have a competitive society and uh, renewing our economy. We're going to control our spending below 1% growth year over year, as we've been doing, and we look to the opposition to continue to support those initiatives which are going to make us competitive in the long term. Mr. Speaker, it's critical that we take a holistic approach to the things that we're doing. One of which is providing confidence, and that is why Answer. our budget has been well received by the very markets that are looking at it is at what we are doing. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. You know, I don't think, um, Speaker, the minister answered my pretty, uh, pretty direct and simple question. Minister, um, you know, we're very concerned that uh, we've seen decisions from the Wynn government basically to cave into the teachers' unions. You're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in more. Uh, union contracts. You tossed out the wage freeze. There's no mention of arbitration reform in your budget, and you've increased spending with 20 brand new promises, including a billion dollars to buy the support of the NDP. The minister says the deficit comes down. Actually, minister, your deficit actually goes up in this fiscal year. I'm worried now that ordinary Ontario families, men and women, are going to have to pay the consequences of your decisions to throw more and more money at every problem under the sun. Last minister, again, very clearly. Do you have a plan to increase user fees on families and businesses by almost $300 million? Yes or no? Mr. Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, our plan is working. We've beaten our targets year over year, $5 billion last year alone because of some of the very restraints that we've taken. And we're already ahead for next year, Mr. Speaker. So we're taking, we're taking steps to transform the way we provide public service. Ontario is the lowest per capita cost government yeah. in Canada yeah. because of the steps that we've taken. Yeah. We're on a path to balance by 2017-18, and that is what's critical. Mr. Speaker, we need all sides of the House working together for the benefit of the people of Ontario. Don't take extreme measures, Mr. Speaker. We're adopting a lot of measures to control our spending, but we're not going to jeopardize the sensitive recovery in this province. We're going to work in a balanced Answer. approach. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your final supplementary. The uh, Speaker, the minister has uh, twice um, dodged a very straightforward question. Are you planning to increase user fees on average Ontario families and on, on businesses? And, I think it's, I suspect it means that he does plan to do so. Uh, Minister, we've already heard you musing about increasing the HST, increasing gas taxes. You've increased spending. And the consequence of all this means that taxes are going to go up under a Liberal NDP coalition, and the deficit actually gets larger. Uh, I want to know why the Finance Minister thinks that Ontario families need to keep tightening their belt when he refuses to tighten their belt one single notch. Speaker. So let me ask the minister again. Back to loosening I, I think that's a tacit admission you're going to ramp up user fees. So if that's the case, when were you planning to announce Washington? to Ontarians that you're increasing user fees by $270 million? Mr. Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, we've put out a number of initiatives to support economic growth. We have over 400,000 net new jobs as a result of the programs we've put in place. We're continuing to invest in our youth. We're going to continue to invest in capital infrastructure and in public transit, and we'll do so for the benefit of our long-term 
success. This is not about election cycle politics, Mr. Speaker. We can't think short term. We got to look at the long term play. And that is exactly what this budget talks about. It talks about our future in as much as it talks about the fiscal constraints that we're taking now. We also have to look at where we're going to be in years to come. I would look to the member opposite to support that initiative because it's imperative that we look for Ontario's long term benefit. Answer. And during my a couple of days that I've had with, uh, with investors and other parts of the world, they appreciate the steps that we've taken Thank in Ontario you. to look long-term, and you. we'll continue to do so. Question? Back Peter. to the Minister of uh, Finance, uh, Speaker. You know, the problem, Minister, is the long-term means you've saddled our kids and our grandkids with $270 billion debt. The long term means that you've doomed our province to underperforming, to mediocrity, to steady decline, where the PC plan will see Ontario surge ahead, to be a leader in North America in jobs, to actually restore hope for those who have lost hope. So if the minister says that his Order. plan is to actually create jobs in the province, then I ask you, Minister, how is bringing in photo radar going to bring a single new job back to the province of Ontario? Is that actually part of your plan? Minister of Finance. That in the first yeah. It appears to me that the member opposite didn't read the budget because we didn't put tax increases in that budget. What we did do is continue to find ways to make our. I think maybe I'll go to individuals now. A member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Minister. Mr. Speaker, in fact, we've cut taxes over the number of years. Yeah. We are one of the lowest tax jurisdictions in North America when it comes to small business, when it comes to corporate, and when it comes to consumers. We recognize how important it is to ensure that Ontario continue to be an attractive place to do business and to invest, and we'll continue on that path. We'll continue to find ways to make Ontario even more competitive. But what is imperative, once again, is that we work together for that end. We cannot take excessive measures across the board cuts that will hamper that growth Answer. is also problematic. And we heard that loud and clear by the investors that we've been speaking to around the world who are looking to Ontario. Austerity measures of extreme measures, that is a reaction Thank to you. the markets. And we won't be. I'll, I'll answer more in supplementary. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. <laughs> well, uh, That's what I don't think is. Thank you, Speaker. And of course, uh, we read through every detail of the budget. No one in the budget was there mentioned of this new uh, tax grab through user fees, nor do the words photo radar appear, Minister. Hopefully you read your own budget or you have some other document. Maybe I do have that document. I'll ask one of the pages to uh, come forward for a sec, if you could, and take this over to the Minister of Finance. It's called 2013-14 Non-Tax Revenue Proposals, and I'll ask Minister to look at page 7. Page 7, Minister, refers to a new fee on our telephone bills. It refers to the expansion of red light cameras and it refers to the reintroduction of photo radar in the province of Ontario. If the minister says his goal is to create jobs in our province, I'll ask you again, how does photo radar bring any jobs to Ontario? And you can tell us today how much more money will you fleece Question. from people's pockets with your photo radar proposal? Be seated. Thank you. I, uh, I promised and I will. The member from Renfrew come to order, please. The member from Durham come to order, please. Mr. Speaker, member we've from made no commitments come to order. of the sort. These, these may be uh, reactions, could be proposals, could be recommendations, it could be things that are being reviewed, but there are not commitments that we've made. The commitments that we've made, Mr. Speaker, are highlighted in that budget. The budget speaks to where we stand and where we're going. That is what we should be concerned about. The member opposite wants to make things up and wants to suggest and views about what possibilities may occur, but I can tell you those are the discussions that we should be having. This is what we want to discuss, and we've made it clear that we will have a discussion before we make any determination. But what's important, Mr. Speaker, is that we continue to invest yes, in our province. Yes, that commitment we've made, and that is what we'll continue to do. Your final, final supplementary. <laughs> well, thank you, Speaker. Respectfully, Minister, we're not making this stuff up. That's your document. It's a Treasury door document. You sit on that. that I have to say I'm a little concerned that you initially weren't admitting that you've 
seen this document or these proposals were there, and you say that there are city proposals. In fact, you know on page three of your own document, you've already agreed to increasing fees and taxes across the province, and you're looking further. So it's, it's awful difficult to tell the Liberals are so hungry for more taxes and fees. So is this a proposal? Is it a given idea? Is it a dialogue? Is it a conversation? Will you then rule out, Minister, if these are not real items, if this is some fictitious document, will then you rule out today no photo radar, no expansion of red light cameras, and no new tax on our telephone Question. and cell phone bills? Will you simply rule that out and say we can't afford it? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, the member from Northumberland will come to order. And uh, the next time I get advice on that side, I'll talk to you as well. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, these are, in fact, proposals, as the member opposite has reviewed, as a result, I presume, because of the Justice Committee's release of confidential reports. So be it, but our budget is on plan, and this is exactly what we want to see happen. This is, these are just documents that officials have been planning and have been suggesting. No determination has been made. So I would say to the member opposite, let's concentrate on what decisions have been agreed to and we have decided to do, and that is on this budget. And let's stick to that plan, a plan that is working and a plan that is being well received, I may add, Answer. by world markets, because they see Ontario as having strong fundamentals. The member opposite should be proud of that, Mr. Speaker, as is Ontarians, and we'll continue to support Thank them. You. Thank you. Question, the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. In 2010, the government promised that every one of Ontario's 600 long-term care homes would receive a thorough inspection. Can the minister tell us how many have been inspected? Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, well, Speaker, I can tell you that, uh, that since 2010, since the proclamation, there have been more than 6,700 inspections of our 634 long-term care homes, Speaker. Uh, last year, there were 2,347 inspections, Speaker. I can tell you that we demand nothing but the highest quality in our long-term care homes. We owe it to the people who are residents there, Speaker, to provide the highest quality care. Perhaps the minister didn't hear the question. The question was about thorough inspections. The question was very specific to thorough in questions, uh, inspections. Sp speaker, since 2010, only 123 of 600 homes have received the thorough inspection that the government promised would happen annually. That's less than 25 per cent, Speaker. That is not a passing grade. Does the minister think it's fair for residents and their families to leave three out of four homes without their annual thorough inspection? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Uh, speaker, I, I need to make this very, very clear. Every home, every long-term care home in the province has an inspector in that home at least every year. Speaker, on average, it's 3.7 times that an inspector is in a home. Our homes are thoroughly inspected, Speaker. Our homes are carefully inspected. Yes, it is true that the homes where there are complaints, where there are critical incidents, get those inspections more quickly, Speaker. But every home has an inspection at least once a year, and on average, far more often than that. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, I'm going to pass the minister over through a page, one of her slide, uh, slides from a, a slide deck from her ministry that says very clearly that the resident quality inspection is the new annual inspection methodology for Ontario. All homes are to receive their first annual inspection under the Long-Term Care Home Act by December 31, 2011. Now, 
I'm talking about proactive inspections, Speaker. The ministry slide deck talks about proactive inspections. The minister tries to fool around with the numbers by talking about complaint-based inspections. General, That's order. not what the people of this province deserve. The government says they plan to eventually conduct thorough inspections, inspections of all homes. I want to know from the minister today, is, the set, is she going to set a date when these actual Question. thorough inspections are going to take place in every single long-term care home in this province? Uh, speaker, let me um, repeat. There is an inspection of every home at least every year. On average, a home is inspected 3.7 times per year. Speaker, our inspectors are in those homes and they respond to complaints. I want to stress, Speaker, that it's very important that people understand that we have zero tolerance for abuse, for neglect in our long-term care homes, and we urge everyone who is in a long-term care home, be they a resident, a family member, a staff member, a visitor speaker, that if they have issues that they think need to be inspected, they, they must report those and we will inspect those. Speaker, we've increased the number of inspectors working in our long-term care homes and we will continue to provide very high-quality inspection in long-term care. Thank you. New question. It's pretty the disappointing. Party. The Liberals, once again, are proving the old adage that uh, figures lie and liars figure. People are concerned about the lack of protection, Speaker. Um, I understand what the, the member is trying to say, but I still think it's what you can't say directly. You tried to say indirectly, so I'd ask the member to withdraw. A speaker. Speaker, my next. Who's your, who's your question to, please? Who's your question to, please? Who's your to, please? Because uh, there were some people talking. Thank you very much. People are concerned about the lack of protection for vulnerable seniors living in care and the fact that the government is not providing the oversight that they promised to provide. The London Free Press reports that the ministry is now urging homes to inspect themselves. Speaker, Is this seriously the minister's plan, to simply let homes in this province inspect themselves? Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, I'm afraid that the member opposite is uh, taking a very serious uh, question and torquing it to her political advantage. I think that's wrong. I think that's disrespectful of the seniors and others who live in our long-term care homes. There are a range of initiatives underway to improve the quality in long-term care homes. Speaker. Many of our long-term care homes are, are very deeply engaged in improving the quality of the care that they are delivering. And I have personally met with frontline workers in long-term care homes who are very excited to be part of the quality improvement process called Residents First that is underway in long-term care homes. Speaker, we're all in this together. It's important that everybody is part of improving the Answer. quality of care. Yes, there is a role for government inspection, but there is far more that must and is being done to improve quality in long-term care. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, what I'm doing is simply doing my job. Perhaps the minister should try doing her job. The government was very clear, Speaker. They were very clear when they promised, they promised seniors and their families a thorough annual inspection of every long-term care home in this province. It was their promise. The ministry said, quote, all homes are to receive their first annual inspection under the Long-Term Care Homes Act by December 31, 2011. This wasn't a commitment to let homes inspect themselves, Speaker, or to do a cursory review, Speaker. Is the minister going to, do, going to admit today that she broke her promise and that their government once again broke their promise to seniors and their loved ones? And more importantly, most importantly, is she going to do something about it? Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, as I said earlier, we have increased the number of inspectors that now have been trained who are doing inspections uh, speaker, in our long-term care homes, but that is only part of what we need to be doing. One of the most exciting things that is happening in our long-term care homes is the addition of highly trained people uh, through Behavioural Supports Ontario who are trained to look after people with dementia. We know that as people develop dementia, their needs change, their, uh, uh, the care that they, uh, that they need changes. And it's vitally important that our staff are trained to deal with people with behavioural challenges, including dementia. We've added 500 new trained people through wow. Behavioural Supports Ontario 
so they can provide the most appropriate care. What we are finding through BSO is that the number of, uh, of challenging Answer. events actually declines because staff know how to care for people with dementia. Your final supplementary. Speaker, here's the facts for seniors in long-term care and the families that love them. The government promised that every home would be subject to a thorough inspection by December 31, 2011. Speaker, it's now 2013, and only 123 of 600 homes have had that inspection occur. Mm. Now, instead of admitting that they failed to deliver on a simple promise to vulnerable seniors and their families, the government says that the homes can inspect themselves. Does the minister really think that that's keeping a promise? Minister. Uh, speaker, let me go back to say that every home is inspected at least once a year. On average, there are 3.7 inspections per year. Speaker, uh, we have added inspectors. When we were elected, we had 59 inspectors. There are now 80 inspectors, including seven more that were hired last year. Speaker, we have zero tolerance. Speaker, in our homes for abuse and, and neglect, we passed a new long-term care act. Speaker, that uh, homes have to develop and implement a policy to promote zero tolerance of abuse and neglect of residents. Homes have a duty to protect residents from abuse by anyone and to ensure that residents are not neglected. It is mandatory for homes to report abuse of a resident, and it is mandatory for the home to contact the police Answer. immediately when there is an alleged suspected or witnessed incidence of abuse or neglect in a home. This is a serious issue, Speaker. We are dealing with it. Thank you. Yes, Question for the member from Foreign Hill. Thank you, Speaker, and to the Minister of Finance. Minister, just because you bury the facts doesn't mean that they don't exist. In the 40 boxes of gas plant documents received on Wednesday, May 29th, your government's appetite and plans to spend are evident on every single page. However, we have yet to uncover one document asking any ministries to reduce spending. There isn't one page devoted to any directive on saving money. Leadership starts at the top, and if the boss doesn't ask for restraint, it certainly isn't going to happen. In my two budgets as, as critic for finance, I have never seen any Liberal government actually look for ways to cut waste and excess spending. You only create new ways to fleece taxpayers to cover up scandals and misadventures. What is in these documents proves that. You don't really have Ontario taxpayers' Western. best interests at heart, do you? Minister, is there a corresponding document listing potential places to save money? To Minister of Finance. Wow. So, Mr. Speaker, they're referring to documents that has no reference to the gas plants, and yet now they're using those documents to uncover things that are only talking about a proportionate amount of what it is we're doing. The member opposite should know this. Our program spending has been below 1% year over year. It is why we've been able to exceed our targets by $5 billion last year, $21 billion over the last four years we've been able to reduce. We've adopted many of Don Drummond's recommendations, and we dedicated a whole chapter in the budget around that, and we're well over 60% of those as well. The member opposite should also know this. 15 of the ministries actually spent less than they were budgeted for. They are doing their job. We're doing what's necessary to support the people of Ontario. Answer. And we look to you to also support us in trying to work for the benefit of Ontario. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Speaker. Supplement. Speaker, that, that just doesn't wash. The first line of the document I'm holding in my hands that the minister has says, and I'm quoting, ministries were asked to develop the following non-tax revenue components as part of their 2013-14 results-based plan. So it came from an ask. Minister, your government shows every sign of being addicted to spending, and you need help. It's unbelievable that on the heels of a scandal costing taxpayers $575 million and counting, you and your government have the audacity to look to taxpayers to cough up more. This government is abjectly incapable of cutting costs. Last week, my colleague from Newmarket Aurora proposed a select committee to help you find savings, and he was serious. I have an idea. Here's an idea. The clowns that you've put in charge at Metrolinx could easily 
easily save a hundred million dollars if they didn't drop a half kilometer of Highway 7 down into Thornhill and create a new St. Clair disaster. If you really want to Thank control you. costs, try the Select Committee Thank and you. try eliminating the Highway 7. Thank you. Minister Finance. Oh my goodness, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite just cited Highway 407. Really? Highway 407? You're the team that sold the Highway 407. Stop the clock, please. I'm going to uh, remind members two things. One, please uh, refrain from calling people by their name. You have a tradition here that you either identify them by their title or by their writing. And the second thing I'd like to remind you to of is anyone who makes any kind of statement that requires correcting, they can correct their own record, and we'll leave it at that. Minister of Finance, please finish. So, Mr. Speaker. The members opposite gave away the 407, an annuity that today would have been great revenue source for the province of Ontario. Furthermore, it should be noted that Ontario is the lowest cost per capita government in Canada because of the steps and the initiatives that we've taken, and we'll continue to do that. But more distressing than that, Mr. Speaker, Answer. the members opposite have, are receiving material to the Justice Committee, material that we've openly and transparently provided because of the fact that they didn't want nothing red acted. Thank you. And as a result, they're making reference to material that doesn't pertain. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickel Bell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. The question I want to express my best thoughts and prayers to the family, friends, and co worker of Captain Don Filter for my riding, to First Officer Jacques Dupuis, to Paramedic Craig Snowball and Dustin Dagenet, who died on Friday, to the Ministry of Health. It is obvious that the idea of self-inspection of long-term care home won't be enough to prevent future abuse from occurring. Speakers, families are seeing loved one abuse in our long-term care homes. Ontarians are reading about a resident in the Scarborough long-term care home who was killed in March of this year. There is no way the minister can say that her government neglect of annual thorough inspection is without consequences. Does the minister agree that it is time Question. for real oversight of our health care system? Good. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, let me, um, let me repeat. Our long-term care homes are heavily regulated and, and, and heavily inspected. Speaker, on average, every home has an inspector in it 3.7 times a year. It is true, Speaker, that they go where the complaints, where, where there are complaints, the inspectors go. Where there are critical incidents reported, the inspectors go in. But they do get into every home at least once a year, Speaker, and on average far more than that. We are all committed to, uh, to doing everything we can to improve the quality of care. And I think it is especially important, Speaker, that long term care homes now are, are very much engaged in the improvement of quality in their long-term care homes. They're measuring quality, and they're Thank working you. to improve quality. That's exactly what should be happening. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians are worried, and they are fearful. They want to see real oversight of the health care system. We suggested that the province ask the ombudsman to oversee health care, but rather than give people an advocate who would be on their side, the Premier dug in her heels. Now, Ontarians are learning that the government is failing to conduct their annual required oversight of long-term care home, the oversight that they promised. If the minister refuses to provide ombudsman oversight of our health care system, what is our solution to guarantee senior safety in our long-term care home? Minister. Uh, speaker. 
Our loved ones in long-term care deserve nothing but the highest yeah, quality care, and that is a commitment that I make and that our government makes to every resident of long-term care and to their loved ones. Speakers. We are working very hard to make our homes as safe as Member possible, from Northumberland, and there is a long-term uh, care task force on resident care and safety. They report back every six month, uh, months on the recommendations that have been made and the action uh, in response to those recommendations. Speaker. Our Long-Term Care Home Act includes whistleblower protection for employees who are coming forward uh, with concerns about the level of care in those homes. We passed legislation, Speaker, to, pro to allow for stronger enforcement, better sure. inspections of long-term care home. And under this uh, legislation, we are seeing an improvement in the in the care that is being delivered Thank you. in our long-term care homes. Thank you. New question. A member from Mississauga East, Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Research and Innovation. You know, Speaker, as Ontarians, we have much to be proud of. For instance, when it comes to the economy, we have one of the few jurisdictions that dominates in not one sector not two sectors, but several sectors. The auto sector, information technology, aerospace and pharma are just a few examples of the sectors that we actually dominate in worldwide. But it's really important that we leverage this, this uh, great strength that we have by making sure that these sectors collaborate with each other. So, Speaker, my question is to the minister. What is this government doing to foster collaboration Across sectors to ensure that we continue to be the best jurisdiction in the world. Good Minister of Research and Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member from Mississauga Cooksville East, Mississauga East Cooksville, for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of fostering collaboration among our researchers and also industry partners. Our commercialization and innovation voucher program will help entrepreneurs and the businesses access to innovation and also productivity and commercialization services available to them in our research institutions. With our $493 million investment in Ontario centers of excellence, we are helping to connect industry of, uh, to Ontario's research and uh, innovation institutions. Last week, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to participate in the Ontario Centers of Excellence Discovery Conference. Uh, this conference, Mr. Speaker, was hugely Answer. successful with more than 2,500 attendees and the largest show floor to date with 350 uh, exhibitors. Thank you, Mr. Two. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, speaker, it's great to hear that uh, our government is investing and using best practices for sharing ideas and resources across sectors. One example is our government's $100 million investment in the Ontario Brain Institute, is, uh, you know, one that uh, shows how we can make gains through collaboration. This investment is supporting a network of data on brain diseases across disciplines. Researchers will be able to turn information into clinical application and commercialization opportunities. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Research and Innovation, what other collaborative initiatives is the government taking part in? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank again the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, during the Discovery Conference last week, we announced a joint Ontario Centers of Excellence and Ontario Brain Institute Fellowship Program. Under this program, we will be investing $400,000 to provide awards to eight postgraduate students and also early stage entrepreneurs to, uh, with, with $50,000 each. This award, Mr. Speaker, will promote commercialization of discoveries that help diagnose uh, and treat or, or cure brain diseases. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is the home for hundreds of top world top-notch uh, neuroscientists, and it's important for us to support collaboration among them. The research and innovation, Mr. Speaker, that is being done in this area, in this province, is recognized as one of, as one of the very best Answer. in the world. Thank you. A new question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the uh, Minister of the Environment. Minister, in December, the Auditor General said, quote, that vehicle emissions have declined so significantly that they are no longer among the major domestic contributor to smog in Ontario. You, on the other hand, told the Toronto Sun last week that, quote, automobiles are the single largest domestic source of smog pollution in Ontario. Minister, who's telling the truth? You or Ontario's respected Auditor General, whose 10 years of service to our province has been marked by honesty, 
and integrity. I think uh, a previous member of this House, Mr. Norm Sterling, I can call him his name now, he's no longer a member, understood this when he introduced uh, the Drive Clean program in the province of Ontario. It reduces unhealthy emissions of cars by up to 36 per cent. Drive Clean reduces automobile pollution in Ontario by more than one third. Thank you. Carry on. Just by making certain that cars drive as cleanly as possible. To put it in a bigger context, Drive Clean cuts smog pollutants by nearly 35,000 tons per year. In fact, the Environmental Commissioner says uh, that he has a report before him, and uh, the Drive Clean program has undergone a number of independent program reviews that concluded significant reductions in smog causing pollutants were being achieved, but that further reductions could result from program improvements, including the implementation of onboard diagnostics emission testing, which is currently underway. That's Thank the you. Environmental Commissioner. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Minister, that simply proves that your Liberal government will stop at nothing to justify drive clean, even if it's introducing a test with a computer glitch to make more cars fail, or inventing stories about the state of our environment to make the program seem necessary. Minister, let's be honest. If you invested that much effort into telling the truth, we wouldn't have the drive clean program, and you know it. Perhaps that's why we haven't seen the detailed cost-benefit assessment of this program that the Auditor General told you to conduct last December. Minister, can we expect to see a report tabled in this House soon, or will you continue to spend your time dreaming up new fabrications to justify this $30 million government cash grab? Thank you. Back. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Uh, I, I'm going to offer a warning as opposed to an ask, but uh, well, you can't say indirectly what you're trying to say directly, so I'm just I'm going to offer the member, please, uh, it's getting too edgy here with this kind of stuff. Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's really interesting that this question is asked this week. Wednesday is Clean Air Day. Here, here. Pollution Probe will be launching its annual Clean Air Commute, and the Conservatives have launched their war against clean air. They scorn green energy and want to fire up the dirty, small, uh, smog-belching coal-fired plants. They want to scrap the Drive Clean program that cuts smog-causing vehicle emissions by more than a third. And so, so they don't know that smog happens to kill. Uh, and the Environmental Commissioner, the Canadian Physicians for Environment, had this to say. Our doctors are extremely concerned about air pollution. In Ontario, nearly 10,000 people die prematurely each year because of smog. Programs like Drive Clean, which reduce smog components and poisons such as carbon monoxide, are very important yes, to public health. Our doctors believe that far from being eliminated, these programs should be strengthened. Ah. The Conservatives need Thank to you. rethink. Thank you. New question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Mr. New Democrats have been clear that we believe in a fair and balanced approach to funding badly needed public transit, but imposing a $1.3 billion province-wide HST hike on hardworking Ontarians is not our idea of fair and balanced. Why is this government so intent on increasing the HST province-wide on hardworking Ontarians? So, Mr. Speaker, um, recommendations have been brought forward by Metrolinx. Uh, recommendations have been brought forward by municipal leaders. Recommendations have been brought forward by the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, by the Toronto Board of Trade. And these recommendations are going to be reviewed. We're going to have an engagement. We'll have our discussions. Let us, all of us, let us all recognize the importance of what's at stake here. And that is what's before us now. We have made no commitments, and we have asked for nothing. What we're suggesting is we need to invest. Yep. We need to invest in our infrastructure. We need to invest in public transit. It's a competitive imperative. It's a social and economic imperative. And we'll work together with Answer. the oppositions to determine what best next steps we should take. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. 
Federal New Democrats, such as Olivia Chow, have been clear that the federal government has an important role to play in funding public transit. But taking over a billion dollars in sales tax out of the pockets of hardworking Ontarians is not a fair and balanced approach. Why is this government so determined to impose a billion dollar plus province wide increase of HST on hardworking Ontarians? Minister of Finance. So, with that, we agree. We agree that the federal government should be at the table. This is a national imperative. It is a priority that, is, that speaks to the competitiveness of Canada, in as much and as much for the benefit of Ontario. So we agree that the federal government should be at the table. As the member opposite should probably know, we also responded to the Minister of uh, Finance federally to his question and his de uh, determination of how to best proceed with our transit gridlock. So I welcome their their, their input. I welcome the third party's input, for that matter, to find ways to resolve the issues, eliminate the gridlock, protect Thanks, our sir. competitiveness, protect the health and safety of our people as well. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. New question. The member from Ottawa remains. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, Ontario is fortunate to have a wonderful, diverse natural landscape full of thriving and independent ecosystems, which host a range of biodiversity. One of the greatest aspects of this biodiversity is our abundance and variety of fish and aquatic life. This rich biodiversity can be found in the streams, lakes, rivers across our great province. It is important for Ontario to protect this resource, not only for the economic benefits that sustainable recreational fishing brings, $2.4 billion a year, it is also important for the environmental benefits that Ontarians enjoy from lakes and rivers teeming with strong and thriving fish species. Speaker, can the minister please explain what is being done Question. to protect aquatic bio biodiversity and preserve this valuable resource? Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Ottawa Orleans for asking this important question. Ontario is indeed fortunate to have an abundance and diverse variety of plants, fish, and wildlife. And in our ministry, there are numerous initiatives that are designed to help protect aquatic biodiversity. Uh, recently, I was in the Port Dover area for the opening of the modernized Normandale Fish Culture Station. This is the oldest operating facility in Ontario, and our government invested $18.5 million for its reconstruction. The facility will now be producing all of the Atlantic salmon for Lake Ontario's Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, a program those who fish in Lake Ontario and its tributaries will certainly uh, enjoy. This restoration project is strengthening the biodiversity of our Great Lakes system by restoring a population of fish that had disappeared from Lake Ontario in the 1890s Answer. due to overfishing. Uh, speaker, we are uh, continuing to invest $5.5 billion a year in fish culture and stocking activities in Ontario and in work and conservation efforts to support fisheries. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for informing the members of this House on what the government is doing to protect and enhance local biodiversity. I'm pleased to hear that both the new facility and the conservation efforts, particularly the restoration program for Atlantic salmon and how it will benefit the biodiversity of Lake Ontario. This, provincial, this province boasts a thriving community of anglers, even from more urban ridings like my own, who are committed advocates of environmental stewardship and aquatic biodiversity. Each year, about 1.3 million anglers participate in recreational and sport fishing in Ontario. And I'm aware that this government prides itself on our sustainable fishing practices. Protection of aquatic biodiversity, specifically fish and fish habitat, is important to many Ontarians, and I know that it is particularly important to the recreational fishing community. Speaker, can the minister share with the members of this Question. house what initiatives this government is undertaking to support local efforts to protect aquatic biodiversity and conservation? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our uh, government is working to ensure sustainable fishing practices to preserve biodiversity in Ontario and encourage local conservation efforts. A prime example of this is the partnership the ministry has with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters to create the Community Hatchery Program. The program will help strengthen community-based fish hatchery operations by providing funding to help local groups operate and maintain these hatcheries. The executive director of the OFAH has endorsed this approach, stating that community-based volunteerism remains a key part of fish and wildlife conservation in Ontario. 
The OFAH has also recognized MNR's efforts to enhance community-based fish and wildlife conservation. Community groups with enthusiastic volunteers spending their time, energy and money to operate local hatcheries that help to stock lakes and rivers throughout the province yes, contribute greatly to our biodiversity. Speaker, we're pleased to support Ontarians who take an active part in local conservation, which is one of our ministry's Thank highest you. priorities. Question, the member from Nepean Carleton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. appreciate the opportunity uh, to ask a question to the Minister of Education. Uh, last week, I asked you why you handed over the reins of hiring power to the teachers' unions at the expense of quality in the classroom. You have effectively handcuffed boards from hiring the best teachers as a result of Regulation 274. But don't take my word for it, Speaker. Uh, Howard Goodman, a trustee from the Toronto District School Board, says this regulation is, quote, harmful to student achievement and well-being. And Cindy, a teacher with Peel District School Board, wrote to you and I and said, uh, Bill two, Regulation 274, quote, forces principals to hire candidates based on seniority over qualifications. Minister, for our support of Bill 115, we demanded that this provision be pulled, yet you snuck it back in. Now, given you had no trouble rescinding Bill 115, Question. Your months after you had put it in place, won't you please rescind this objectionable regulation too, so that school boards and principals can get back to hiring the best teachers? Thank you. For education. Yes, thank you. And uh, I think uh, one of the places where we differ from the official opposition in our approach is that we believe that it's very important that we collaborate with our education partners. That includes collaborating with all. Our, our, our education partners, both those, the teachers but also the school boards. We believe that everybody needs to work together. And that's exactly what we're doing on this file. Is uh, Number one, we're looking at how do we move forward in the future with a new collective bargaining structure that will work for everybody. A structure that will work for the government, a structure that will work for school boards, and a structure that will work yes, for our employees. So that's our number, our number one uh, priority: is looking at how Thank can you. we establish a better work Thank relationship. Thank you. Senior, please. Supplementary. Speaker. On May 27th, you would have received a letter from uh, the Ontario Catholic School Trustees Association. On the second page, it says, uh, we now face a further erosion of our ability to hire the best teachers for our students due to the modifications to Regulation 274. Uh, that's the Catholic Board. The Public Board President uh, Michael Barrett said this, these changes are making, that you are making do not rectify any issues that school boards put on the table. It compounds them even further. And Janet McDougall of the Peel District School Board said, Flat out, I think it's just an incredible waste of resources. I guess everybody else just agrees with us because you simply are not doing your job and getting it done. In fact, your own constituents who are teachers are writing to you and asking you to rescind this regulation and go back to a merit-based hiring system that our PC leader Tim Hudak is calling for. You are forcing professional and young teachers out of the jo their Question. job in favour of union leaders who will give their own jobs to their own friends. Want to stay. So don't Stop. you think this will affect quality in our classroom? And don't you think Thank hiring you. based on merit will be the Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Speaker, and uh, we recognize that are, there are some concerns with this particular regulation, which is exactly why we have set up a working table. We have set up a working table uh, in our memorandum of understanding with the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, with OSSTF, and with OXBA, the Ontario Public School Boards Association. So, in fact, there are ongoing uh, meetings that. That working table has in fact been set up and my offer to those groups and my offer to all the other school board and union groups is if you can come up with a better version of the regulation in fact we are willing to amend the regulation Answer. that work has been a offer has also been made to the catholic boards and i fully look forward Thank to you. the uh, parties resolving Thank you. the issue New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Uh, last month in Thunder Bay, the Premier avoided answering direct questions about Northwestern Ontario's electricity needs. 
Mining companies in the Northwest need electricity security in order to invest and create much needed jobs for Northerners and First Nations communities. The cancellation of the gas plant conversion, yet again in Thunder Bay, shows that the Liberal government just doesn't have a long term plan for job creation and electricity security in the Northwest. My question is a simple one, Speaker. Where will Northern Ontario's electricity come from if the gas conversion is no longer needed? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Right to the Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Uh, I thank the uh, member for the question, Mr. Speaker, and it is an important issue uh, for Northwestern Ontario. Uh, I did meet with the mayors from the north uh, uh, several weeks ago, uh, Mr. Speaker. I also met with the task force uh, uh, that is engaged in the community to deal with this particular issue. Uh, I particularly uh, gave the people of Thunder Bay and north uh, a commitment that they will have the energy that they need when they need it. They know that we are working on a solution, Mr. Speaker. They know we're looking at alternatives. We've shared those alternatives with them. We have not made a choice yet, Mr. Speaker but we will in the very near future, and the people in Thunder Bay will be extremely pleased with the answer that we have for them. Here, here. Two supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier said she's interested in economic development for the North, but mining development won't get off the ground without a ready, reliable, and local source of electricity. Northerners don't need rhetoric, Speaker. They need action. In southern Ontario, the Liberal government wasted well over half a billion dollars on cancelling gas plants. Instead of making policy on the fly, Speaker, and leaving Northerners to pay the price of government mismanagement, when will this government keep their promise to Northerners and ensure their energy needs are met? Mr. Speaker, Minister. we thank and applaud the North for what they're doing in the area of mining and everything related to the mining industry. The people from the task force, Mr. Speaker, include people from the mining industry. I took the occasion to thank them for the work that they're doing. They are contributing the second largest contribution to our GDP in Ontario is coming from the mining sector. Mr. Speaker, the mining industry will have the energy they need when they need it. The people in the north will have the commitment that they will be able to go out and sell the mining industry with the knowledge that they'll have the energy that they need and the mining industry needs. Thank you. New question, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, Speaker. This question is to the Minister of Government Services. Minister, the former Conservative government never had a plan to implement the photo health card in Ontario. The expansion of service Ontario across the province, especially in northern and rural areas, has made access to photo health cards available in nearly 300 centres. Many people still have the old red and white health card. They and many health care providers were relieved to know that people can convert to the new photo health card at their local Service Ontario location. The budget before this legislature proposed investing $15 million during the next three years to speed up conversion from the red and white health card to the safer and more secure photo health card. Minister, how will this expenditure Western. help Ontarians make that change, and what difference will it make? Mr. Government Services. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As members may know, uh, my ministry is responsible for health card re registration and related support services, and I think members are aware of the need to uh, convert the old red and white cards to eliminate fraud, keep Ontarians' information current, and create a more secure and transparent system. Great. As the member mentioned in his question, and I thank him for it, the proposed budget uh, before this legislature provides funding for a more efficient health card transition process. Presently, although 76 percent of, all, of all, all Ontarians have converted their cards, that still leaves a significant yeah, number that need to uh, convert it. Uh, I want to assure those with the old red and white cards that they will still be Give eligible to be card. used, oh, but over the next number of years, we will be aggressively converting them to the photo cards. In fact, Mr. Speaker, by our current estimates, based on the proposed budget, all health cards in the province are expected to be converted before the end of 2018. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, supplementary. Minister, people have told me that the old red and white card does not offer sufficient protection from misuse and abuse. Even with a rudimentary background in information technology, one can see many ways in which a careless or a negligent patient can lose control of his or her health card number 
or how a rogue health care provider could use the old red and white health card to treat patients who are not eligible for OHIP coverage. At this past weekend's Bread and Honey Festival in Streetsville, someone asked how they might convert to the new health card and whether that might mean an interruption in their coverage. Minister, what is the province doing Question. to make the conversion to red and white health card as easy as and as convenient for Ontarians? And just one more time, can Ontarians still use the old red and white health, uh, health card? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure uh, uh, all members and all Ontarians that until uh, the conversion takes place to the photo card, that people can still use their old red and white card. Uh, in terms of accessing uh, the service, uh, the Ministry and Service Ontario has made it easy and convenient for Ontarians to convert their health cards. Service Ontario it reaches out to individuals by mail, asking them to visit a location in order to re-register their old cards. Our government has expanded access to routine health card services from 27 permanent issuing offices to almost 300. As an example, in Northern Ontario, we only had six uh, centres offering the service in the past. Now you will find almost 70 Service, on, uh, service Ontario centres in that part of the province. Answer. I think this is a significant improvement for families in rural and northern communities who in the past had to drive long distances. Now, Mr. Speaker, 95% of Ontarians are within 10 kilometres of a Thank service you. Ontario. New question. The member from Malcolm, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Last week, Minister, you belittled the hard-working correctional officers at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre. You continue to say that safety of correctional officers and inmates is your top priority. However, you knew overcrowding was an issue, and yet many cells are still occupied beyond capacity. You knew the meal hatches were a problem last year, and you haven't done anything about it. You knew that staff didn't have adequate fire-related equipment, but you, you did not procure anything better. You say safety is your top priority. Why should we believe you now? Yep. Indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker, the member of the uh, official opposition is right, ensuring the safety and security of our staff and our inmates is my number one priority. So last week, I met with uh, many representatives of OPSU. Uh, including the leadership at EMDC, and the meeting was very productive. Very productive, and I was happy to hear firsthand from the union about uh, the concerns, their concerns. We have expedited some security features for the end of June, and we will continue the dialogue with the union and a meeting regularly with uh, the staff yes, of the ministry my ministry, and we're all very engaged in uh, finding a great solution for EMDC. Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Minister, that meeting should have occurred two years ago yeah, when yeah. I first told you of these problems. <laughs> minister, last Thursday, the jail was locked down while staff tried to recover metal pieces that went missing following the fires last Tuesday night. Every time the jail is locked down, it creates residual problems. Lawyers can't consult with inmates and, as a result, must delay court proceedings. This creates cost to taxpayers, burdens an over overly already burdened backlog court system, and delays sentences for offenders. Minister, the problems you've ignored at EMDC are now spilling over into other ministries. Will you admit you're not up to the task to do the job and resign? You see the case? You see the case? Thank you. Minister? Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, health and safety and the uh, uh, security of both the inmate and the uh, workers, the correctional uh, officer uh, at EMDC, are my number one prior priority. But one thing was clear when I met with the union. They said, you know what? You're stuck with a problem which they on the other side have started. So it's not coming from me, it's coming from the union. They were very, very clear. You know the overcrowding? Because there was no plan to expand the facilities and to have more facility built. What they have done, they took every space that were used for programming 
to put the cells in it. So we have a so we have solution. We, have, uh, we are building two new facilities. One will uh, open pretty soon, and the other one is in Windsor. And we will continue to renew our infrastructure in Thank that you. ministry. Thank you. New question: The member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Minister of Education. Students uh, and parents are here at Queen's Park today to lobby against the proposed cuts to itinerant music teachers and music instruction in Toronto schools, and they're not alone. According to People for Education, students uh, at one in three elementary schools across the province do not have the opportunity to learn a musical instrument or participate in a band, orchestra, or a choir. Why are students in Ontario being forced to go without music, arts, education, when it is part of the province's compulsory curriculum? Minister of Education. Yes, as, uh, as, as uh, the member opposite actually just pointed out, the uh, music is actually part of the required curriculum, uh, particularly in elementary schools and in every grade. So the primary way of funding elementary uh, music programs is through the foundation grant to the schools. And Toronto District School Board actually uh, receives $1.2 billion in funding. However, we recognize that uh, for some teachers, uh, they may not, particularly as they get more up into grade five, six, seven, eight, that they may not have the musical background. So in fact, we have provided funding for 4,800 specialist elementary teachers. Toronto District School Board actually got funding Answer. for 626 specialist teachers. So it would be up to the board to decide whether Thank or you. not to spend that on music. Supplementary. Speaker, there was a time uh, in 2003 when the then trustee Kathleen Wen and this current minister fought the then provincial supervisor, Mr. Paul Christie, who was trying to make the same cuts to itinerant teachers, and how things have changed 10 years later when this government is attacking arts education. Last year, they eliminated the program, enhancement, uh, the program enhancement grant for arts programming. This year, provincial advisors, their advisors, are urging the Toronto District School Board to drastically cut music education. At one in three Ontario schools, students receive no basic music education. When will the minister cut, put in place a policy and funding to ensure all students have the opportunity to learn an instrument, perform it, acquire, band, thank or you. orchestra? Of yes, thank you. And I think we do need to sort out the information here. Number one. There are lots of classes in which the classroom teacher does have a background in music, amongst other things, and the, and the classroom teacher is totally qualified to deliver the music instruction. However, if you look at the People for Education information, what you see is that as there has been declining enrollment in many schools throughout the province, that in fact what many of the specialist music teachers uh, are not located exclusively at one school, but actually cover several schools. So that if you look at the number of Answer. schools in Ontario where there's either a permanent specialist music teacher or an itinerant specialist music teacher, that has increased. Thank speaker. you. The member from Wellington Halton Hills on a point of order. On a point of order. Last Thursday, the Minister of Energy made a substantive government announcement announcing major changes to the FIT program outside of this legislature. And I would like to seek unanimous consent of the House to allow the minister to revert to statements, minister statements, to allow the Minister of Energy to explain to this House the changes that he's made, as well as giving us clarification on whether or not municipalities truly have the last word with respect to these kinds of applications. Yeah, yeah. That's we need to know. Thank you. Thank you. You Please. Member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Has... Thank you. The member from Wellington, Halton Hills, is seeking unanimous consent to revert back to statements for the Minister of Energy to make comment. Do, do I hear agreement? I'm afraid I heard a no. 
This house, there are no deferred votes. This house stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.